This is Crosscut Reports. I'm Sarah Bernard. Today, we're talking about graffiti. The fact is, we've seen an increase in graffiti since the pandemic. Specifically, a new effort in Seattle to address what the mayor has called a dramatic increase in illegal graffiti across the city during the past few years. Crosscut arts and culture reporter Margot von Singel dug into the new initiative and asked some of the complicated questions it raises about the ethical and artistic ramifications of a plan that aims to both remove graffiti and prosecute those who create it. And when there's a debate between what's tagging or defacing and what's art, who gets to decide? And where do they draw the line? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you really well. Great. Hooray! Magic! <laughs> wow, I can hear my own voice really well, too, which right. is more concerning. But Yeah, I know the feeling. My name is Margot von Singel. Uh, I'm the arts and cultural reporter at Crosscut. Quite frankly, we are rewriting our approach. Is it safe to say that, that Mayor Bruce Harrell's new plan, is that what spurred you on this reporting journey, the plan itself? Yeah, I would say the plan itself, and I had been thinking about this story for a while. Um, During COVID, a lot of the uh, boarded up storefronts became kind of vehicles for public art. So we saw a lot more public art, a lot more street art uh, in the cityscape. We saw it during the protests as well. We saw the Black Lives Matter kind of Mm -hmm. street mural on Capitol Hill. Uh, You can see behind me. Uh, there's a very large mural that's now covering the street. And so that kind of spurred for me a couple of conversations about graffiti and street art. Uh, and I talked to a lot of people at the time because when we were reopening, they were taking off the boarded up storefronts. And so it, it became a conversation about what kind of art do you save? Fast forward to um, 2022 and then... Mayor Bruce Harrell, even before he announced his plan, was already talking about graffiti. And we saw kind of more high profile, I would say, kind of removal, uh, removals of graffiti happening. And, and one example is, which I think happened about a year ago at this point at um, 12th and Jackson in Chinatown in the National Seattle, District. Something that Seattle's new mayor, Bruce Harrell, has called Operation New Day. They were trying a new policing, hotspot policing approach there, and they were kind of, quote unquote, cleaning up that corner. And um, within that process, a mural that had been there for a really long time by a, a local graffiti writer, graffiti artist, got uh, painted over. And so that was kind of one of those points I was like, well, I need to start paying attention to this. Yeah, the mayor is calling it the One Seattle Graffiti Plan, and it would rely on more than $940,000 of the mayor's Could you just tell us a little bit about what's going to happen this year? What's what's uh, the mayor's plan? Yeah, so so the mayor's plan is trying to approach this surge in, in graffiti from kind of all these different angles. One is to increase, you know, abatement or removal of graffiti. The Parks Department is getting more money for a new team to actually do that, to to handle graffiti abatement in parks specifically. Um, So that's one thing. Another thing is more uh, prosecution, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's in collaboration with, you know, SPD for arrests, the city attorney's office, and then eventually the courts as well. So what that means is basically that they'll prioritize prosecution, seek increased penalties for quote-unquote prolific taggers. For Mm -hmm. other people, um, they'll look for more community service type work or quote-unquote diversion programs. And then the last one is to to kind of combat graffiti with art. Um, And so that's a new program. It's called Spatial Justice Through Street Arts. The idea is that they will pay community-based arts organizations to work with youth and actually pay them to create street art. The mayor's office is saying that this plan comes in response to a major increase in complaints about graffiti. 20,000 reports of tags and graffiti vandalism. The reports of graffiti that are submitted by the public, those reports have grown by more than 50 percent from 2019 to 2021. Um, Mm. And we're also seeing that the the number of uh, instances where graffiti is cleaned up has increased, you know, over those uh, two years. Um, and the city says it cannot catch up. The truth is, the negative impacts are tangible. They're not theoretical. Historically, you touch on this in your piece, there is a conflation between um, kind of graffiti 
and crime or graffiti and urban decay. Um, and I just wonder if we're in this sort of strange post, not really post pandemic time where like, uh, economic inequality is mm-hmm. as terrible as it's ever been, if not worse. And you have um, huge, huge crisis and homelessness and housing. And it just seems like there's some um, interesting perceptual correlation between the times we're in and this issue of graffiti. This professor that I talked to, uh, Stefano Bloch, um, he is specialized in like criminology and graffiti. He has done a, ro- a lot of research on that. He also used to be a graffiti writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he kind of says that, you know, in moments of economic downturn, at a time of increased frustration uh, from, from people, um, you see this crackdown on graffiti that h- tends to happen. Like that's not as... That's not a new phenomenon. He has seen that happen over, you know, multiple decades. I had one artist um, who works in Belltown. He's not a graffiti artist, but he works on, you know, kind of murals in public art and knows a lot about the neighborhood. And he says that he sees, uh, like, buildings that are empty, that are vacant, most often tagged. And for him, the way that he was grappling with that, he was like, well, for me, they, they are kind of like a symbol of inequality of the housing crisis, of developers being able to leave these buildings empty while people are struggling to survive. And maybe maybe if I have to, you know, psychoanalyze a little bit, maybe that's how graffiti artists are kind of like, well, F it. I'm just going to do it if that's kind of the symbol of that inequality. And, you know, interestingly, the mayor said something very similar. Oh, really? I asked him, I asked him, why do you think we're seeing this increase, you know? And he said, you know, um, and I'll quote you for a second, quote, number one, we have to admit in the city of Seattle and in our country, there's just a lot of anger, end quote. And so he mentioned housing issues, income inequality, issues around race and social justice. And so he was saying, like, there's a younger generation that are looking at these levels of wealth that have been created in this country. And we're in a situation where an artist or a teacher who were once considered middle class, now they can barely survive. And the younger people are seeing these contradictions in our society. You know, combine that with COVID, people Mm -hmm. losing their jobs, being scared for their lives, and you kind of create a fertile ground for something like this. That's what I find um, so fascinating about graffiti, too, is that it is it is many things at once. Perhaps it's a form of protest. It's It correlates and conflates with issues of inequality, with issues of urban decay. You know, just like whether or not that's true, it just has all of these perceptions kind of wrapped up into it. And so it's mm-hmm. like many, many things at once. For example, um, you write, graffiti is technically a crime, but plenty of people consider it an art form. And few expressions center so heavily on name recognition and absolute anonymity at the same time. The culture is highly competitive, but also built on mutual respect and mentorship. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the process that, that led you to this understanding. Like, how did you find people and, and did you did you sort of come to this analysis through those conversations? or? Yeah, yeah mostly through conversations. And um, I didn't have a ton of contacts within that community. I knew I knew a few people who I, you know, emailed and, and gave a call. And then um, I had actually, you know, one person who really helped me reach out to a ton of people and like kind of brokered uh, the contact, which which really helps uh, to create oh, yeah. trust. And so it's through those conversations that I really started to understand better what graffiti culture was about. Because there's a lot that I didn't know, you know, the the, mm-hmm. the mentorship aspect is really something that I I didn't know. You know, mm-hmm. people are really kind of brought up in the culture. They are kind of by, by the older generation taught. You teach people both um, techniques, you teach people how to become better, but you also teach them kind of the rules of the game. Um, and some of that is, for example, um, you don't spray paint over someone's work if you can't do something that's 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 better. A lot of people in uh, the graffiti culture feel misunderstood, mm. in part because it's kind of it's kind of a language that is for a smaller group of people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the the letters uh, that are on there are not necessarily supposed to make sense to everyone. They're supposed to make sense to a smaller group of people who know what the names of the groups stand for, what how 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 to read the letters even. But to mm-hmm. outsiders, that looks incomprehensible or like, you know, for some people even associated with like aggressiveness or anything like that. I've also learned a lot about the wording. So, you know, you have a tag, which is kind of a, you know, one line type of uh, quick 
uh, lettering. Then you have a throw up, which is kind of more the bubble letters that you see that are like mm -hmm. filled in just maybe a little bit or sometimes not. Um, and then you go from there and then it's what it's called a piece. Would you say that the people you talk to, do they consider themselves artists? I think most people do, but I'm not sure that everyone does. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on who you talk to. I think some people, and, and particularly people that I talk to, are more comfortable with the mainstream, right? So mm -hmm. the people who are actually doing tons of tagging and are not really interested in doing a mural that the city commissions, mm -hmm. those people are harder to, to reach. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that how those people think as much. The distinction that I would make and why I use writers mm -hmm. um, in the story is if graffiti is allowed, it's maybe technically not graffiti anymore. And so what people do is they call it graffiti art or graffiti style art. So for example, if I would commission an artist to come paint on the side of my house, that would not necessarily be graffiti. That would be graffiti art or, or graffiti style art. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like the fact that it's illegal is part of the draw or part of the entire concept. And so does painting over it work? It depends on who you ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll start with uh, the people who, who think it does work, um, which is this professor who said it could work if you really kind of put a lot of effort behind it. Um, he did say that, you know, an aggressive, quote unquote, aggressive buffing campaign and buffing is painting over graffiti, um, that that could work, but that it also could drive writers to go higher and more out of reach. I also talked to a, a realtor and commercial property manager and just kind of community advocate in Belltown, Tom Graff, and he does really believe that it could work. He says, you just have to keep at it. Don't stop. Just don't let them win. Um, and he says that when you keep doing it and you do it regularly, they kind of get the message and they, they, they move away to another spot. And then when you ask the artists, they are like, no way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just immediately like no um i had this one person who was saying well the people who buff you know who paint over these these walls they're just creating a blank canvas for us like it's neat and i actually had i think it was someone else who said well we kind of consider the the buff man part of our community in a way because they oh. they create this blank canvas for us that we can go paint on and so this it's kind of this ecosystem and so we're kind of like maybe they're even part of our community without realizing it wow so i think opinions are divided on that and i think the city's thought on that is that's you know we have to at least provide this level of service even if it's kind of the dog chasing its tail is a quote from the mayor he does acknowledge that it's kind of a an endless cycle, potentially. And he does say that this plan is supposed to break that cycle. Hmm. And and it is true that the plan does not only consist of increasing abatement and removal, um, but it remains to be seen whether, whether that will work. Do you feel like you found that you learned something through this reporting process or something that really struck you or surprised you that you had really never thought about before? Writing this story really got me to pay attention in the city differently. Hmm. So I, I bike a lot, I walk, um, and I feel like I was kind of living next to graffiti. I wasn't really paying attention to it. But now that I was, you know, writing it for the past month or so, um, I feel like I'm starting to recognize the names. I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention to the style, to the letters, to the placement. And it's kind of changed my relationship with the urban environment a little bit. I feel like I'm a little like a scavenger hunt almost. It's kind of seeing it as another another layer of information in the city that you can um, kind of crack open a little bit. Uh, and maybe you have feelings about it, and I think a lot of people do, but at the same time, it maybe, for me, has become a little more legible, mm -hmm. um, and I think that could potentially change people's relationship with it as well.
Thanks for listening to Crosscut Reports. This episode was reported by Margo Bonsingle and produced by me, Sarah Bernard. Our story editor and executive producer is Mark Baumgarten. You can subscribe to Crosscut Reports wherever you listen. And whatever platform you're listening on, please review us. We'd love to know what you think of the show. Also, if you'd like to support the work we do at Crosscut, whether it's our lineup of podcasts, the live events we host every month, or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com slash membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to the on-demand programming of Seattle's PBS station, KCTS 9. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. Crosscut Reports is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Sarah Bernard. We'll be back soon with another episode.